as you may know, one book, One New Pulse, is featuring Margaret Atwood's Taxi, which is an imaginary telling of Shakespeare's The Tempest. Imaginary is the operative word for this evening's offerings, as they defy easy categorization. Among the miniatures we've gathered here are a reconfigured fairy tale, insights into women's novels, the home economist method of making a man, an unexpected reaction at a musical, and Gertrude offering Hamlet a piece of her mind. So let's begin. Nobody asked you to stick in your oar, or whatever you want to call that thing. 
stand up now. It didn't kill you. Did it? Five. I no longer want to read about anything sad, anything violent, anything disturbing, anything like that. No funerals at the end, though there can be some in the middle. If there must be deaths, let there be resurrections, or at least a heaven, so we know where we are. <laughs> Depression and squalor are for those under 25. <laughs> they can take it. They even like it. They still have enough time left. But real life is bad for you. Hold it in your hand long enough and you'll get pimples and become feeble-minded. You'll go blind. I want happiness. Guaranteed joy all round. Covers with nurses on them and brides, intelligent girls, but not too intelligent, with regular features, regular teeth, and pluck, and both breasts, <laughs> the same size, <laughs> and no excess facial hair. Someone you can depend on to know where the bandages are, and to turn the hero, that potential rake and killer, into a well-groomed country gentleman with clean fingernails and the right vocabulary. <laughs> Always, he has to say, forever. I no longer want to read books that don't end with the word forever. <laughs> I want to be stroked between the eyes, one way only. <laughs> Six. Some people think a woman's novel is anything without politics in it. Some think it's anything about relationships. Some think it's anything with a lot of operations in it. Medical ones, I mean. Some think it's anything that doesn't give you a broad, panoramic view of our exciting times. Me, well, I just want something you can leave on the coffee table and not be too worried if the kids get into it. <laughs> you think that's not a real consideration? Go along. Seven. She had the startled eyes of a wild bird. This is the kind of sentence I go mad for. I would like to be able to write such sentences without embarrassment. I would like to be able to read such sentences without embarrassment. If I could only do those two simple things, I feel I would be able to pass my allotted time on this earth like a pearl wrapped in velvet. She had the startled eyes of a wild bird. Ah, which one? A screech owl, perhaps? <laughs> or a cuckoo? It does make a difference. We do not need more literalists of the imagination. They cannot read a body like a gazelle without thinking of intestinal parasites, foods, <laughs> and smells. <laughs> she had a feral gaze like that of an untamed animal, I read. Reluctantly, I put down the book. Found still 
inserted at the exciting moment. He's about to crush her in his arms, pressing his hot, devouring, hard, demanding mouth to hers as her breasts swish the top of her dress. <laughs> but I cannot concentrate. Metaphor leads me by the nose into the maze, and suddenly all evening lies before me. Porcupines, weasels, warthogs, <laughs> skunks, their feral gazes, malicious or bland, or stolen or piggy and sly. Agony to see the romantic frisson quivering just out of reach, a dark winged butterfly stuck to an overripe peach, and not to be able to swallow or wallow. Which one? I murmur to the unresponding air. Which one? <laughs> Thing to be said for this method, though. 
these guys are scotches. <laughs> Good enough to eat. <laughs> Three, clothes method. Clothes make the man. How often have you heard it said? Well, we couldn't agree more. However, clothes may make the man, but women, by and large, make the clothes. So it follows that the responsibility for the finished model lies with the home seamstress. Use a good pattern and cut on the lines. Otherwise, your man will be all screw-jiggy. Pre-shrink the fabric, or your man will turn out to be smaller than you'd hope. <laughs> Sew the darts first, and remember to give that tummy a good tuck. You'll be sorry later. Watch those zippers, and badly placed zipper can cause serious functional problems. <laughs> it's fun to be different, but not too different. Casual or formal is up to you. If in doubt, make two and alternate. Be sure your house has a lot of mirrors. Men made this way, like budgies, seem to enjoy them. One very creative woman we know sewed her entire man out of rubber sheeting. Then she used a bicycle pump. Amazing! <laughs> Four, marzipan method. We've often thought men would be easier to control if they were smaller. Well, excuse a tiny rascal you can hold in the palm of your hand usually found on wedding cakes. These formally dressed mini grooms require painstaking attention to detail, but it's worth the time you spend with the paintbrush and the food coloring to see the finished result, smiling at you with deceptive blandness from the frothy topmost layer of seven minute boiled icing. <laughs> We much regret the modern custom of substituting plastic for the original sugary confection. For one thing, there is absolutely no payoff when you feel the urge, as we do, to pop one of these dapper devils into your mouth and suck off his Clothes. <laughs> Five. Folk art method. You've seen these cuties in other folks' front yards, with little windmills attached to their heads. They hammer with their little hammers, saw with their little saws, or just whirl their arms around a lot when there's a stiff breeze. Alternatively, they must, they may just stand stock still, holding on to bridles, lanterns, or fishing poles. Some of them may be in known costumes. Why shouldn't you concoct one of these cunning fellows for your very own? No reason at all. Just your hubby with plaster of Paris <laughs> and <laughs> burlesque twice, or maybe it was only once, and one of my friends went the other time and told me about it. It was considered quite daring for young women to go to such a place. We thought it was funny, as funny as church. You gotta stand up comedy, a movie, and a man who juggled plays, as well as the striptease act. They used a lot of colored lighting, red and blue and purple. 
Each girl had a fake name. Miss Take, Miss Behave, Flame LaRue. I like the names and the costumes for their ingenuity. And I like the more skillful girls, the ones who could twirl tassels or make their bellies or buttocks rotate in a circle. That was before they had to take it all off. There was an art to it. It was almost like the plate juggling. I liked the way they floated in the pools of colored light, moving as if they were swimming, mermaids behind glass. One woman began with her back to the audience, the spotlight on her. She was wearing long white gloves and a black evening gown with gauzy black sleeves that looked like membranous wings as she stretched out her arms. She did a lot with her arms and back. But when she finally turned around, she was old. Her face was powdered dead white. Her mouth was a bright reddish purple, but she was old. I could feel shame washing through me. It was no longer funny. I didn't want this woman to take off her clothes. I didn't want to look. I felt that I, not the woman on the stage, was being exposed and humiliated. Surely they would jeer and yell things at her. Surely they would feel they had been tricked. The woman unzipped her black evening gown, slipping it down, and began to move her hips. She smiled with her white mask of a face, and her purple mouth inside her lips, her teeth glinted, dull white pebbles. It was a mockery. She didn't intend it. She knew it was a trick of another kind but we didn't know who was playing it. The trick was that suddenly there was no trick. The body up there was actual. It was aging, not floating in the spotlight somewhere apart from us. Like us, it was caught in time. The victory burlesque went dead. Nobody made a sound. <laughs> at school used to tease the life out of you. The nicknames and those terrible jokes about pork. I wanted to call you George. I am not wringing my hands. I am drying my nails. Oh, darling, please stop fidgeting with my mirror. That'll be the third one you've broken. Yes, I've seen those pictures. Thank you very much. I know your father was handsomer than Claudius. Highbrow, aquiline nose, and so on. Looked great in uniform. But handsome isn't everything, especially in a man. And far be it from me to speak ill of the dead, but I think it's about time I pointed out to you that your dad just wasn't a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Noble, sure, I grant you. But Claudius, well, he likes a drink now and then. He appreciates a decent meal. He enjoys a laugh. Know what I mean? You don't always have to be tiptoeing around because of some holier-than-thou principle or something. Oh, by the way, darling, I wish you wouldn't call your stepdad the bloat king. <laughs> he does have a slight weight problem, and it hurts his feelings. The rank sweat of what? 
My bed is certainly not enzymed, or whatever that might be. A nasty sty, indeed. Not that it's any of your business, but I change those sheets twice a week, which is more than you do, judging from that student's slum pig pen in Wittenberg. I'll certainly never visit you there again without prior warning. <laughs> I see that laundry of yours when you bring it home, and not often enough either, by a long shot. Only when you run out of black socks. <laughs> and let me tell you, everyone sweats at a time like that, as you find out very soon, if you ever gave it a try. A real girlfriend would do you a heap of good. Not like that pasty-faced, what's her name? all trussed up like a prized turkey in those touch-me-not corsets of hers. If you ask me, there's something off about that girl. Borderline. <laughs> Any little shock could push her right over the edge. Go get yourself someone more down to earth. Have a nice roll in the hay. Then you can talk to me about nasty styes. Oh, no, darling, I'm not mad at you, but I must say you're an awful prick sometimes, just like your dad. The flesh, he'd say. You'd think it was dog dirt. <laughs> you can excuse that in a young person. They're always so intolerant. But in someone his age, it was getting, well, very hard to live with. And that's the understatement of the year. Some days, I think it would have been better for both of us if you hadn't been an only child. But you realize who you have to thank for that. You have no idea what I used to put up with. And every time I felt like a little, you know, just to warm up my aging bones, it was like I'd suggested murder. Oh, you think what? You think Claudius murdered your dad? Oh, well, no wonder you've been so rude to him at the dinner table. <laughs> if I'd known that, I could have put you race straight in no time flat. It wasn't Claudius, darling. It was me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 